Only you can prevent wildfires. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Greetings and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise are solely those of your host and movie critic Dan Burke, yours truly. They do not necessarily reflect the respective views of any individual employees of the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. And this show is dedicated to my favorite topic, which is movies. And there is a lot going on in the news, a lot. And I don't usually discuss it unless it pertains to movies, but I do have to say that there has been a lot of devastation over the last two weeks involving Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma. So I just encourage all you listeners to please give what you can, preferably um, in terms of money, to the Red Cross or any other organizations that helps the victims down in the South, either in... Texas, Florida, or any of the other states affected by these hurricanes. It's been devastating to see the news about this. And it actually reminded me a lot of what I saw in this past summer's underrated Inconvenient Sequel, which, if you haven't seen it, by all means, please see it. doesn't matter what your political views are. The, the devastation that's been happening to the Earth as a result of these drastic hurricanes and other weather-related events is real. It does have to do with climate change. So please give what you can, but also heed the warning that the... Well, I I won't get too preachy, but again, I just issued the views and opinions part of the show. So with that said, I will just get into my next segment, which is what's topping the box office. These are the top 10 highest grossing movies of this past weekend. And number one at the box office is the movie It. I expected this movie to be number one. What I didn't expect is that this movie would make almost $120 million more than the movie at number two at the box office, but as it turns out, that is exactly what happened. So it ha- actually has the highest opening of any movie in September ever. Not adjusted to inflation, mind you, but even still, that's really impressive. So it grossed, in the United States, $123.4 million. Around the world so far, it has grossed $189.7 million, and that is against a budget of just $35 million, which makes it already in its first weekend, not even a full week in theaters, it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. That does not happen often, especially with a movie with a budget of $30 million or more. Home Again is number two at the box office, debuting at number two. It grossed $8.6 million, again, nearly $120 million less than it. That is crazy. But Home Again grow, um, made $8.6 million against a budget of $15 million, so it's not a hit yet, and I don't have the overseas numbers for you, but it doesn't have too far to go to recoup its budget, but will it be a certified hit? We'll have to see. The Hitman's Bodyguard was number one for the last three weeks, but this week it dropped to number three, having grossed only $4.8 million. But against a budget of $30 million, the Hitman's Bodyguard has so far grossed $64.8 million here in the States and $107.1 million around the world, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Annabelle Creation was number two at the box office last week, and I think for the last three weeks. This week, it drops to number four at the box office, having only grossed $4 million. Against a budget of $15 million, though, Annabelle Creation has so far grossed $96.3 million here in the States, and a staggering $280.3 million around the world. It goes without saying that Annabelle Creation is a certified hit here in the States and globally. Wind River dropped slightly from number three last week to number five this week, having grossed $3.1 million. Against a budget of $11 million, Wind River has so far grossed $24.9 million here in the States, 
and 29 million around the world. So Wind River is off to a slow start, especially considering that it was released initially in limited release, but now that it's nationwide officially, not just in the art house cinemas, it is now officially a certified hit here in the States and around the world, and you will most certainly be hearing about this movie come Oscar season. I can almost guarantee it. The movie Leap, also known as Ballerina, is number six at the box office this weekend, dropping from number four last week, having grossed just $2.4 million in its third week in release in the United States. Against a budget of $30 million, it's not doing especially well in the States, having only grossed $15.8 million in its entire three-year run. However, since it was released early in countries like France and even Canada, it has grossed a total of $99 million around the world, making it not a hit here in the States, but around the world it is already a certified hit. Spider-Man Homecoming was number seven at the box office last weekend. It was number seven the week before that. This week, guess what it is? Number seven, holding steady at number seven, having grossed $2 million, but against a budget of $175 million, Spider-Man Homecoming has so far grossed $327.7 million here in the States and $823 million around the world. So, while it's not a certified hit here in the States, surprisingly, it still is a tentative hit, but around the world it's already certified, and I think that's pretty much all that counts. Dunkirk is number 8 at the box office this weekend, sliding from number 6 last week, having grossed $1.9 million this weekend. Against a budget of $100 million, Dunkirk has so far grossed $183 million here in the States and $493 million worldwide, which makes it very close to being a certified hit here in the States, but it's a tentative hit right now. But around the world, it is most certainly a certified hit. Logan Lucky drops from number five last week to number nine this week, which is really too bad because, as I've been saying, Logan Lucky is a much better movie than The Hitman's Bodyguard, but unfortunately it's not making nearly enough, having just grossed $1.7 million this weekend. Against a budget of $29 million, Logan Lucky has made so far $25.1 million here in the States and $31.7 million worldwide, making it not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is a tentative hit. And finally, the emotional Emoji Movie is number 10 at the box office this weekend, having made $1.1 million. Against a budget of $50 million, it made $82.6 million here in the States and $171 million worldwide, which makes it tentative in the States, certified worldwide. There are many sounds in your daily life. Ones that make you smile. <laughs> Ones that help you relax. And there are some sounds that can help save lives. Wireless Emergency Alerts. Now on many mobile devices, use a unique sound and vibration to bring you critical information about emergencies in your area. With updates from local sources you know and trust, you can be in the know wherever you are. Learn more at ready.gov slash alerts. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is evening gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and you are listening to Words on Film on bostonfreeradio.com, watching me on Somerville Community Access TV or some community access TV station near you that has picked up this show, and thanks to you for picking it up, or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic which is movies the first movie would be excuse me the first movie i'm going to be reviewing for you is it it is a movie that's probably going to sound a little bit like an abbott and costello routine when i talk about it but i'm going to try to avoid any sort of abbott and costello misunderstandings as much as i can but it is the long-awaited big-screen adaptation of the book of the same name by Stephen King, which is probably one of his best, arguably one of his best-known books. It's not the first screen adaptation of it. 
The first one was the 1990 made-for-TV movie starring Tim Curry as Pennywise, as well as several other notable actors. But this is the first time that It, which is a very long book, I think in its paperback form it's about five to 600 pages, it was a little bit difficult to bring this to the big screen. And this version of It, which is now playing in theaters, is not entire, doesn't encompass the entirety of the book. The book consists of basically the present and the past sort of interchanging. In this movie, it is solely of the past. In other words, there are kids who are affected by this this demon known as it and they are they band together when a shapeshift when this shapeshifting demon who takes the appearance of the clown of of a clown named pennywise begins hunting children i think a lot of you who are particularly familiar with stephen king probably know the story and actually as much flack as the original 1990 it gets for being a tv movie and a made for tv movie at that in other words it's not rated r and it, it was aired on network tv back before they had the tv ratings like tv 14 or tv ma and so on but for in all intents and purposes Steve, uh, the original Stephen King's It was pretty scary for a TV movie. I remember seeing that when I was a kid and being pretty horrified at Tim Curry's clown. Looking back, uh, Tim Curry's Pennywise clown is a little bit hammy and a, a little ridiculous, including some of the scenes where they used obvious claymation for some of the special effects. But for its time, it was pretty scary, at least the part with the kids in it. But... This is, without spoiling too much, this on-screen adaptation for the big screen is the first part. It, as I said, the book, it told, and for that matter, the TV miniseries told two stories. One from kids' perspectives, and the other from these kids' adults' perspective. Well, the adult movie is coming soon. This on-screen adaptation of it is just focusing on the kids including there is a young kid named Bill Dembro who has a stutter and he's played by Jaden Lieberher the, and there are various other kids of certain archetypes there's the well-read Ben Hanscom who's played by Jeremy Ray Taylor and Jeremy Ray Taylor is the heaviest of the kid boy uh, of the seven kids in this group but what i liked about the movie and maybe they did this in the book i don't know i actually haven't read the book but i liked that he was the heavy kid but he wasn't the stereotypical heavy kid who was shoving cupcakes into his mouth and also the kid who has the glasses in this group is not the smartest one i thought that was also a very clever move however the kid was cast as the kid with the glasses the, the character's name is Richie Tozier, and the kid who plays him is an actor named Finn Wolfhard. I didn't think that casting was particularly good, not because Finn Wolfhard isn't a good actor. He's a very good actor. But Finn Wolfhard is actually the star of the hit Netflix series Stranger Things. And I think when you see him in this movie, It, and, you've, and you're already familiar with Stranger Things, as I am, you're inevitably going to make comparisons between the two. And I don't think that was a very smart move casting-wise. But with that said, Finn Wolfhard actually did a pretty good job in this movie as his on-screen character, Richie. And there's also, there are three other kids in the group who are band together because they're bullied. But there's also a girl in the group whose name is Beverly, who comes from an abusive household with a single father. And there's a story there, which I won't reveal, but you can definitely tell what the story is, not from what they tell you, but from what they show you. And she is played by a fine young actress who I think is going to go on to some very big things, named Sophia Lillis. So I really did think that the, the kids in the group, all together, with some exceptions, did pretty well and worked well alongside one another and the guy who plays the clown P 
Pennywise is a young actor named Bill Skarsgård, who is actually the son of actor Stellan Skarsgård. This isn't his first on-screen appearance, but this is the movie you're going to best know him for, for playing. And I thought he played Pennywise a lot better than Tim Curry did in the original It. He didn't ham it up so much as he made this clown legitimately scary. And there were moments in this movie, even though I didn't think it was the the scariest movie I've ever seen, there were parts where Bill Skarsgård absolutely terrified me. So, how does this movie stand compared to other horror movies this year? It is the scariest movie of the year, but that's almost like being the best player on a team that sucks, like the New York Knicks. Apologies to New York fans out there. (laughs) But not sorry, because I'm in Boston. But I do have to say that it was a more satisfying adaptation of a Stephen King novel than this year's The Dark Tower, but I did feel like it was missing something. There were certain moments of the movie where there were, were events that were told but not shown, and I don't have very much time to delve into it, but it, I thought, lived up to some of the type, but not all of it. I did think it was good for jump scares, but I didn't think it had that eerie feeling that went along with other Stephen King stories or with the miniseries in general. But I do give it a check out because I think it will satisfy most horror fans. Woo! Let's get crazy! In movies, when someone at a party jumps into a pool fully dressed, everyone cheers them on and jumps in too. Just so you know, in real life parties, nobody jumps in after you. You just look stupid. Come on, jump in! Come on! Most party fouls are pretty dumb, but if you decide to drink and drive underage, you could lose your license and your freedom. Learn more at ultimatepartyfoul.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson, and I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, Old School R&B, Soul, Blues, Jazz, Gospel, Folk, Old School Country, Zydeco, All Music New Orleans, Rockabilly, Bluegrass, World Music, Comedy, Poetry, and Spoken Word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Just another reminder that Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Home Again. This is the latest from director and writer Hallie Myers Shire, who is actually making her directorial and screenwriting debut with this movie and apparently this is a movie that they tell you on the poster is from nancy myers and that is a little confusing because it it gives you the impression that nancy myers directed this movie and this this movie does have a nancy myers fear to it nancy myers for those you don't know is the writer of such movies as the Intern, The Holiday, and It's Complicated. And also, Something's Gotta Give. These are all movies, some are good, some are kind of rom-com fluff, that once you see the movie, if, if you see these movies back-to-back, or even five-minute clips of them back-to-back, you'll notice that they all have something in common. They're all about getting older, true. They all have a certain feel to them. But they also look like Pottery Barn catalogs. There is not a single pillow or a single drapery that is out of place in any of these movies. And I'm not sure if Nancy Myers so much produces or directed, 
or directs these movies as much as she does set design. They are all about white, upper middle class people from ages, I don't know, 40 to 80. And they're all pretty much about the same thing, about getting older and having some sort of romantic life beyond your prime 20s and 30s years in a way that's respectable but when nancy myers puts her hands on a movie it kind of becomes the same old thing and now when i'm looking at the movie home again and i'll explain the the plot in just a moment i begin to think this movie does not feel like a real movie and i like some of nancy myers earlier movies i did like the intern a lot i thought it was a pleasant comedy but it actually It was original enough, and I thought Robert De Niro and Anne Hathaway did a great job in that movie, and it was original. But the problem with Home Again is it doesn't feel original. And I'm not and I think that Nancy Myers actually meddled with this movie, which made it feel like a Nancy Myers movie rather than a Hallie Myers Shire movie. But here's what the movie's about, for those of you who are interested. Life for a single mom in Los Angeles takes an unexpected turn when she allows three young guys to move in with her. The single mom in question is a woman who is just turning 40. Her name is Alice Kinney, and she's played by Reese Witherspoon. Alice has two precocious daughters. She has 12-year-old Isabel, who's played by a lovely young actress named Lola Flannery, and a 6-year-old, I think, 6 or 7-year-old named Rosie, who's played by Eden Grace Redfield, who's also very cute. So, the deal with Alice is that she left New York because she's separated from her music executive husband, Austin, who's played by Michael Sheen. Did Austin do anything particularly wrong? Not exactly. I think the movie could have gone for some cliche plot point like he cheated on Alice. And understandably, that would be a good reason for Alice to leave Austin, but at the same time, the whole cheating thing's kind of been overdone. And I liked actually the subtlety of the reason that Alice left Austin, that he was dedicating a little bit too much time to his business and his staying out late, partying, didn't work well for a couple in their 40s as opposed to a couple in their 20s. That's understandable. That's the part I like. But the movie really fell off the rails when the introduction of three wannabe filmmakers, actually a little bit better than wannabe. These are filmmakers who actually did make a short film, which they are in the process in the movie of adapting into a feature-length film. There is the director, Teddy, who's played by Nat Wolf, and there's also the writer of the film, George, played by John Roditsky, and the lead actor in the film, Justin Miller, who's played by Reed Scott. So these actors are okay. The problem I had with Nat Wolf was that he was basically just a good-looking guy. And naturally, he was striking up a relationship with Reese Witherspoon's character. And that's another thing about... Reese Witherspoon's character. She is a single mom who goes from New York to L.A., and you would expect that maybe a single mom would have a little bit of trouble paying the bills or paying the rent, you know, starting over. Well, it turns out she's actually moving into a penthouse, which was owned by her father, who was a prolific filmmaker in the same kind of vein as john houston or john ford in other words he's a director who's had a history in hollywood and he leaves behind this house to his late wife lillian stewart who in this movie is played all too briefly by candace bergen and candace bergen is usually a very welcome presence in a movie but here she's only in the movie for about 10 minutes and she has very minimal influence on alice or her daughter's And basically, she just come and go. So, back to the relationship that Nat Wolf's character has with Reese Witherspoon's character. You can tell that they have a fling, they start a relationship, and about halfway through the movie, I could definitely tell that there was something that was going to gradually wedge them apart. But the problem was, there wasn't enough substance between the two characters. 
Did they have chemistry? A little bit. Were they good looking? Definitely. But there wasn't much that was interesting about Nat Wolf's character or the way Nat Wolf played him. I thought that his comrades, Justin and George, were a little bit more interesting, especially the character of George. And turns out George does have feelings for Reese Witherspoon's character. But the the love triangle kind of disappears and then reappears almost in a blink and you'll miss it moment. So this movie is full of bland characters who are underwritten and look like they are in a Pottery Barn catalog. And that's really all there is to say about Home Again. I laughed maybe once during this movie, but it didn't even give me a feel-good feel good feel feeling it's a great looking movie but it's a movie to which i give my rating of a flunk out nancy meyer should have kept her hands off this you know what really gets a party started indoor baseball yeah just find a broom or a pool cue and you can use like anything as a ball cans bottles shoes hey bro toss me that avocado most party fouls are pretty dumb but if you decide to drink and drive underage you could lose your license and your freedom Underage drinking and driving, the ultimate party foul. Learn more at ultimatepartyfoul.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Did you know that you can now find Boston Free Radio on iTunes? We're in the eclectic internet radio category. So what are you waiting for? Tune in now. Whether on iTunes or on bostonfreeradio.com, Boston Free Radio is there for you. These are not just academic exercises. A world run by a handful of greedy bankers can't possibly last. The only solution is to fight. I'm going to tell you a number of things, but you really only have to remember two words. Governments lie. New England Unsettler. Mondays at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is 9-11, a movie that, probably not coincidentally, came out mere days before the 16th anniversary of the World Trade Center towers collapsing on that uh, on that horrible day in 2001 that all of us who are over the age of 25 remember extremely well. So this movie, 9-11, does take place in New York City. It does take place in one of the Twin Towers. And it's about a group of five people who find themselves trapped in an elevator in the World Trade Center's North Tower on 9-11. 2001. They work together, never giving up hope, tr to try to escape before the unthinkable happens. It's a movie that's directed by Martin, I'm going to say Gigi, his, his last name is spelled G-U-I-G-U-I, -U I'm just going to say Gigi, and it's based on a play written by Patrick James Carson, which is known as Elevator. I haven't seen the play, and I wasn't entirely familiar with with the play when I going into this movie, but I do have to say that the movie had me on the edge, especially when you're seeing these these people get into this elevator and they're in the elevator, not knowing exactly what's going on on the outside, even though there's a hell of a lot, and there are electrical problems as would be expected, and there's an elevator operator who's played by Whoopi Goldberg who is trying to get in contact with them. The main problem here, I don't think, is the story, although it feels mightily exploitative coming out in theaters days before 9-11. But what really feels off about this movie is primarily the casting of Charlie Sheen in the lead role. Charlie Sheen, for those of you who have been living under a rock, has been doing so much damage to his career and to himself over the last 10 years that it's really not even funny. And Charlie Sheen is at that precarious moment in his career where he has done so much damage to his career and, his, and himself that unlike other people who have made 
miraculous recoveries like Robert Downey Jr. or Mel Gibson, it's unlikely that anyone will ever take Charlie Sheen seriously seeing him on screen again. And he was the major detriment to this movie, but not the only thing that was wrong with it. As I said before, seeing these five people in this elevator, I did fear for their safety, so I I guess there was that. But again, Charlie Sheen himself brought the whole movie down. But He wasn't the only thing, but it was something else involving his character that also brought the movie down. No pun intended with the elevator. So his character, Jeffrey Cage, is a wealthy Wall Street executive who is in the middle of getting a divorce from his longtime wife, Eve, played by Gina Gershon. So Charlie Sheen and Gina Gershon have no chemistry together and yes i get that they're a couple who's in the middle of getting a divorce but you have to have chemistry with your co co co-actor even if you're fighting with them there has to be some sort of chemistry either positive or negative and negative chemistry is not the same as having no chemistry so there's that but there's also once you're introduced to their characters in the very beginning of the film and they're in the world trade center having this very early meeting about getting divorced, you you can instantly tell that there's going to be some semblance of a love story here. And if you're going to make a movie about 9-11, you don't need a love story. A love story was appropriate for Titanic. It's not appropriate for the World Trade Center Towers because there was so much more going on with that natural disaster than there was with Titanic. Again, Two tragedies, but they are different tragedies with different things at stake. So having a love story in this movie felt it made it feel even more exploitative. Now, was I personally offended by watching this movie? No. But I don't I don't know anyone personally who died in either the Trade Center collapsing or the attack on the Pentagon. I do know of a lot of people who did, though. But there was one fact that did not come to my attention until after I saw this movie. And it's that Charlie Sheen himself is one of those people who believes the conspiracy theory that 9-11 was an inside job and that the World Trade Center towers collapsed not because of the planes crashing into them, but because... There were people who set off detonation devices below the Trade Center. This is a conspiracy theory that is entirely without merit. And conspiracy theories in and of themselves are completely without merit. But the fact that Charlie Sheen believes that is just another whole reason not that he should not have been involved in this film. If Charlie Sheen wants to make a legitimate comeback, he has to show people that he's changed. And I'm not just talking about hard partying or any of the other things he did that put him on the gossip columns. I'm not talking about that. The real reason that Charlie Sheen is not the actor he was in the 80s, 90s, or even the early aughts when he was doing that show Two and a Half Men, which was a hit show. I never really liked it, but I know a lot of people who did. But if he wants people to know that he's changed he has to show that and being in a movie like this about such a catastrophic event is not the way to do it i think it's too big a jump too soon so i is charlie sheen the only thing wrong with this movie Not the only thing, but I think it's one of the biggest things. Could it have worked with another leading man besides Charlie Sheen? Perhaps. But having the couple in the the elevator who are in the middle of getting a divorce and are reconciling as the Trade Center Towers are coming down or as they're about to come down, I didn't buy that at all. And it doesn't matter if it's Charlie Sheen or even George Clooney who plays this part. It just shouldn't be in this movie in general. I guess other actors in this movie, like Olga Fonda, Whoopi Goldberg, Louise Guzman, did what they could with the roles they were given, but I cannot give this a recommendation. I I have to say, admittedly, that I was thrilled 
or entranced by these people trying to get off the elevator before the towers collapse, but it felt way too exploitative, and it gets my rating of a flunk out. And it probably would have been a little bit more had Charlie Sheen not been in it, but not much. Did you just look down at your phone? You did it again, didn't you? You know, you're flying down the road in a three-ton hunk of steel, and a text takes your eyes off the road for an average of five seconds. At 55 miles per hour, that's long enough to travel the length of a football field and cause some serious damage. Turn it off. Trust me. Whatever it is, you'll live. Learn more at StopTextStopRex.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hi, I'm Pierce. And I'm Calvin. And are you tired of fake news? Yes. So tired. Sorry, were you asking me? I was just in general. Oh, well, I, yeah, yeah. I'm, I can only speak for me. I'm really tired of so, fake news. Yeah, me too. So, good thing is we run... Uh, oh, that's right. Radio we, show. Right, we have a radio show where we uh, try to debunk fake news... We try to cut through all the all the oh, crap. Crap. Yeah. Because there's a lot of it. Uh huh. And we're trying to bring you f- straight facts. Straight facts. Oh, it's called Fact Up. It's our show's called Fact Up. It's not called Straight Facts. facts. No, the show is called Fact, Fact Up. Up, and it's Mondays at 2 p.m. and it's an hour long. Yeah, only on BFR. <coughs> Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the next film we're going to be reviewing for you is one called Patty Cakes. This is an underground, well, not entirely underground film. I'm not sure exactly what qualifies as underground, but it's a movie you're probably not going to find in your local multiplex. Probably a multiplex that has a number of movies, like an AMC theater near you, and that's not a plug for AMC. What I'm saying is there's there are a few AMC theaters that have 19 or 20 theaters that actually have a vast array of films that are not just the big-budget Hitman's Bodyguard or It. They actually show a fair number of legitimate indie films as well which i I respect them for showing but anyway patty cakes is the movie that marks the feature-length debut of director jeremy jasper who is a native of hillside new jersey and that's where this movie takes place and before patty cakes jeremy jasper directed a number of video shorts including strangely enough selena gomez in the scene love you like a love song this was back in 2011 fast forward six years later and he's directing a movie that's very much unlike a selena gomez music video no disrespect to selena gomez but the protagonist in patty cakes is a uh, an aspiring rapper by the name of Patty, who goes by also, I, I think it's Original P, before she changes her name to Patty Cakes in the end. And she's played by an actress named Danielle McDonald, who is, I, I try not to be sexist or be discriminatory against women, but a lot of times when there's an attractive woman in a movie, I say, a very attractive or very lovely woman. Well, Danielle McDonald is not attractive, not at least not in this movie, and that's again, I'm very apologetic about that, but th- I, I think that's the point of this movie. And what I liked about it, and the reason that I'm pretty sure that this was pretty much untouched by the major Hollywood studios' hands is the fact that if they were casting the movie, they would probably cast a more attractive woman as the titular character but i liked that the character in this movie was overweight and not especially attractive that is one of the obstacles over which this character has to overcome and i've respected for that and in the hip-hop world there are it's still male dominated there are some notable female rappers but there are very few white female rappers iggy azalea is one of the few and 
she's going through a career rut right now. But there are no white, overweight female rappers. So the motivation behind Patty wanting to become a rapper is she wants to get into the game just like any other rapper would. But, of course, she has her image being an obstacle. (laughs) But she has a support team that does not include her family, including Barb, who's played by Bridget Everett, who is who was an aspiring singer in the 80s before giving up on the dream. But she does have a circle of friends, including a pharmacist named Jerry, who is an Indian man played by Siddharth Jananje, who, even though he has a, a steady job, he also is equally inspired along with Patty, to break out and become an unlikely rap superstar. There's also a reclusive DJ who lives off the grid whose name is Bastard, who's spelled, whose name is spelled B-A-S-T-E-R-D, not T-A-R-D, who's played by a, a mysterious actor named Mamadou Athey. And... He's, I don't know, I'm not sure how mysterious he is in real life, but in the movie, he is extremely mysterious. He also talks with a very cool bass voice, and he wears a glass eye. It's, it's not, he, he doesn't need the, the glass eye. It's more like a contact lens that makes it look like a glass eye, but either way, he looks like, and some of his music sounds like a black Marilyn Manson, which, I thought was incredibly cool. And one of the last characters in the movie is actually Patty's grandmother, who's known as Nana, who's played by Academy Award nominee Kathy Moriarty. And I didn't recognize Kathy Moriarty when I saw her in this movie. I forgot to turn off the ringer on my phone. Well, anyway, as I was saying, I didn't recognize Kathy Moriarty when I saw her, but I instantly recognized her by her voice, which hasn't changed all that much since she was in Raging Bull. She has a very distinctive, um, raspy voice, and she is the only person in Patty's family who actually believes in her dream. And so the four of them, Patty, Jerry, Bastard, and Nana, form a group called PB&J. P for Patty, B for Bastard, N for Nana, and J for Jerry. And the movie is very similar, I think, in plot to 8 Mile. But then again, 8 Mile was actually more similar than you might expect to Saturday Night Fever. Again, it's about somebody who has high aspirations to make it in the entertainment business, usually as a performer, and also has the odds against him, or her in this case, in that they live in the inner city, and it's there while they have connections, they have to work probably a lot harder than most to overcome the brutal cutthroat entertainment industry so again this movie shares some similarities to eight mile but it is not an eight mile ripoff by any stretch of the imagination i loved danielle mcdonald in this movie not only did she rap incredibly well and probably could have held her own against Nicki minaj or mc light who by the way the latter of whom makes a cameo in this film but she also just embodied the character so well. And I also like the fact that, no, she is not attractive, but she was probably one of the most dynamic characters that I've seen on the big screen this year. So Patty Cakes gets my rating of a knockout. I think this is a movie you will like, even if you're not a fan of hip-hop. I like most hip hop, but I'm I'm actually not a big fan of the new stuff that's coming out, particularly the mainstream stuff. But Patty Cakes is a timely movie in the sense that if you hate the mainstream stuff, you will like what's going on in this movie, which is presumably what's going on in the underground. They'll challenge your authority because that's what kids do. But this car is your territory. And in here, your word is law. So when you say you won't move until everyone's buckled up, you won't budge an inch until you hear that click. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. For more information, visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup. I love those reels. 
music sound They're the ones that move me A thinly blow New rocky tone Intensify and groove me All this and more on Unpopular Music, Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And last week, I only had three movies to review because that was a very slow Labor Day weekend. You would have expected one new movie to come out. And actually, in retrospect, and I think that Warner Brothers and New Line Cinema should have thought of this, It should have come out on Labor Day weekend. Yes, it made over $120 million this past weekend, but chances are it probably would have made $150 million had it come out the weekend before. But getting a little I'm getting a little off topic, so I'll get back to what I was talking about. So I only reviewed three movies last week, and I dedicated the next two segments, which I would have would have set aside for movies to talk about the fact that this box off the Summer box office was the slowest it had been in 15 years. And I was speculating as to why that was. And it's not that bad movies were coming out. It was just that there were very limited options, I think. And the the movies that were marketed the most and put in the forefront were altogether not great movies to begin with such as the Emoji Movie, which I gave my rating of a flunk out to, and also the Hitman's Bodyguard, which I didn't hate, but it wasn't all that great. But my point was, there are great movies out there, and I think more people have to go to these art house cinemas to see such great movies. And that segues into the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you, which is Lost in Paris. Lost in Paris is a movie that was made in in France and in Canada, and it is a collaboration between directors, writers, and stars Fiona Gordon and Dominique Abel. Who are these people, you might ask? Well, they are very talented, very fluid slapstick actors who have previously collaborated in writing, directing, and starring in such previous films as The Fairy from 2011, Rumba from 2008, and Le Iceberg from 2005. So are these movies you've heard of? They're movies I definitely haven't heard of, but after seeing Lost in Paris, I would love to check out their previous repertoire. So Lost in Paris is the movie about a woman named Fiona, who's played by Fiona Gordon, Is she playing herself? I'm not exactly sure, because she's a librarian who lives in Canada, and she visits Paris for the first time to assist her myopic Aunt Martha. Catastrophes ensue, mainly involving Dom, played by Dominique Abel, a homeless man who has yet to have an emotion or thought he was afraid of expressing. So the movie is very much slapstick, but it's also part love story, and the part of... Fiona's Aunt Martha is played by the late, great Emmanuelle Riva, who is not only a French actress, but she also is a woman who has actually been nominated for an Academy Award for her role in the movie Amour, which came out in 2012. So when she was nominated, uh, Emmanuelle Riva, she was 85 years and 321 days old which makes her, to date, the oldest actor, or rather the oldest actress, the oldest woman, ever nominated for an Academy Award for acting. So she earned this honor in 2013, the same year as the award's youngest ever nominee, Kuvenzali Wallace, who was nominated for Beasts of the Southern Wild. Unfortunately, Emmanuel Riva died earlier this year, on January 27th at the age of 89. But the fact that she's gone so far in her acting career and was only nominated once at the age of 85 tells maybe aspiring actors anywhere or even people who are aspiring to do something and think they are too old, including me at the age of 34, 
It is never over until you have no breath in your body. As long as your heart is still beating, there is always one more time. But with that said, Emmanuel Riva actually has certainly one of her last roles here. I'm not sure if this is her very last role, but it's a role to go out on, and in a comedy no less. Emmanuel Riva is not particularly well known for comic acting, but in this movie she plays a senile old woman and... It's it's certainly a great note to go out on for her, because even though she doesn't have the physicality of Fiona Gordon or Dominique Abel, she certainly has surprising moments of physical comedy in this film. In fact, there's a great scene where she has a moment with a long-lost love named Duncan, who's played by Pierre Richard. The two of them are sitting on a bench, and in probably one of the most iconic scenes ever, both of them, while sitting down, have a dance number. Let me say that again. Both of them, while sitting down, have a dance number. Both of them actually move their feet to music. And the way they move their feet, and the way they're in sync with one another, is even more impressive than when Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling did the same thing in La La Land, which was no doubt inspired by an earlier movie musical, probably involving Gene Kelly. And that makes me a questionable cinephile, because I don't know exactly where that that foot dancing while sitting down came from. But I was more charmed by Pierre Richard and Emmanuel Riva doing that dance while sitting down in Lost in Paris than I was in La La Land. And make no mistake about it, La La Land was a great movie and certainly deserved the Academy Awards for which it earned. I'm not knocking that movie at all. But it was something a little bit more charming to see older people do it than to see people in their 20s and 30s perform the same act. Because I think with people in their 20s and 30s like Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling, it's a little bit more expected, but when older people have that kind of chemistry and that kind of synchronization, it certainly is very impressive. But in addition to Emmanuel Riva's one of her final final roles, I thought Fiona Gordon and Dominique Abel acted really well in this film as long lost milk toast lovers who are reluctant to cross paths at least Fiona with Dom but once they do the the sparks fly and i loved the on-screen location shooting of Paris in this movie it's certainly a well done film i would love to see Fiona Gordon and Dominique Abel's previous films, and I think I will, but Lost in Paris gets my rating of a knockout. So, you know, I'm a dog, and I'm kind of new to this family, but I've noticed a trend. My humans do this thing where they go around and get all my toys and hide them in this basket, but it's always the same basket, and it's always the same place, and then they act so surprised when I find them, but I'm like, hello, that's where you put it last time. Humans are the worst at hide-and-go-seek. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Topper's Radio. That's one word. dot blogspot. dot c o m. Topper's. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and now that I've reviewed the five movies that I'm going to review for this show, that I told you I would review for the show, I'm now going to get, get blah, going to get into my next topic, which is what's coming out next. This is a spoken word preview of the movies that are coming out this coming weekend. Before I get started, I just want to say that when I give you this this film synopsis, I'm not saying whether the movies are going to be good or not. I really don't know. There may be a movie, and this has happened before, movies that I think look good that ultimately end up being pretty bad, and there are movies that, much to my surprise, have exceeded my expectations. So, I go into every movie with an open funnel, 
granted, there are some movies that I know from the start are going to be bad, like any movies where Tyler Perry dresses up as an old woman. Those movies are definitely going to be bad. In fact, coming out later this year is going to be Boo 2, A Medea Halloween. Oh boy, when will we ever learn? But anyway, getting into what's to- uh, what's coming out next. The big movie that's coming out in theaters nationwide is the latest from director Darren Aronofsky, which is Mother. And this stars Jennifer Lawrence, Javier Bardem, Ed Harris, and Michelle Pfeiffer. This is a movie about a couple's relationship that is tested when uninvited guests arrive at their home, disrupting their tranquil existence. So Darren Aronofsky is known for directing very intense movies. Of course, the movie that comes to mind... The, the greatest when it comes to Darren Aronofsky is Requiem for a Dream, which is probably one of the most intense movies about drug abuse that I have ever seen. And it's a movie that, yeah, I saw once and was traumatized by it, but then I came back to it again and again and was fascinated by it. And even when I was horrified the first time I saw it, I was still fascinated by it. It is an intense film, but one I absolutely loved. So, no pressure on on this movie, Mother. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence is still a hot commodity right now. I don't know how this movie's going to be. I haven't seen any previews for it, but it is probably going to be an intense movie. And, of course, the stars of the movie, especially Javier Bardem, have been in some intense movies before. So, this will probably be nothing new to them. Will it be great? Will it be better than Requiem for a Dream? Doubtfully. Will it be better than Black Swan? I don't know, but I'll see it, and I'll let you know what I think next week on my show. Another movie that's coming out this coming weekend is American Assassin. This is a movie that's centered on counterterrorism agent Mitch Rapp. This movie stars Dylan O'Brien, who I'm not entirely familiar with, but it also co-stars Michael Keaton, Sanaa Lathan, and Taylor Kitsch, all fine actors. Let me just look up Dylan O'Brien. Dylan O'Brien is a young actor. He is only... As of the date of the show, 26 years old. But so far, he has actually been in a number of movies and TV shows, including the Maze Runner movies, uh, the two of them that have come out. He was in Deepwater Horizon. And he was in one episode of Teen Wolf Revelations, which was a show that aired on MTV that I've never seen, but about which I actually hear good things, unlike most things that air on MTV. But American Assassin should be a breakthrough role for Dylan O'Brien, and if it isn't, then we won't hear from him ever again, probably. But I'll see that movie, and I'll let you know what I think when it comes out in theaters this coming weekend. The other movies may or may not be coming out in theaters, but I'll just give you a brief synopsis of them. There's one that's called Brad Status, and this movie stars Ben Stiller, Austin Abrams, Jenna Fisher, and Michael Sheen. My God, is there a movie that Michael Sheen is not in? The guy seems to be in everything nowadays. But anyway, Brad's status is about a father, presumably played by Ben Stiller, who takes his son to tour colleges on the East Coast and meets up with an old friend who makes him feel inferior about his life's choices. The movie is directed by Mike White, who wrote a number of films before this, but is also best... Best known this year for penning the excellent movie Beatrice for Dinner, which starred Salma Hayek and John Lithgow, which is a movie I really liked. So, Brad's status, I'm not sure what that movie's going to be like. Ben Stiller is usually good in indie films, as he is in big-budget films. Probably even better in indie films, arguably. But Brad's status is a movie I will seek out. Can't guarantee if I'm going to see it for next week's show. But... I'll check it out if, uh, if it is in a theater near me, and I'll let you know what I think next week.